Welcome everybody to the second session of the Hackaday Introduction to Software Reverse Engineering with Ghidra course. I am your instructor, Matthew Alt, and today what we're going to be talking about is identifying C constructs in assembly language. So a lot of people reached out with questions about, you know, how to identify certain constructs like this when looking at assembly language and trying to kind of determine what the C code was that wrote it. And so that's what we're going to get into today. So quick overview, we'll do a little bit of really quick class admin here, just to make sure everybody's on the same page with regards to the office hours and the exercises and everything. And then for those of you that didn't show up to or couldn't make it to office hours last week we have a few quick tips for the exercises that some people have found useful and so i wanted to go over those kind of with everybody here and then we're going to talk about control flow so how a program executes and kind of the different directions or paths it might take when it executes which involves going over things like function calls which as you can imagine are you know, function calls in C, but how we're going to address them from the perspective of the assembly language. We'll talk about loops and iterators, how to identify those in assembly. We'll talk about switch statements and how to identify those. And then we're going to go over global and local variables, what those look like, and then array accesses and manipulation. And so for each of these things, we're going to be kind of going over what they look like in assembly, how they translate back to C, and then what you can do using Ghidra to make them a little more readable and a little more, we'll call it, you know, accessible for the decompiler. So again, today we're going to be going over kind of identifying some of these basic C constructs in assembly language. Some of you are probably familiar with these, um, and if you're not, we go over what they do during the class as well. So everybody should be on the same page. And so here again is another list of what we're going to look at. We're also going to talk about heap memory today, which we skipped over in the last class, and sort of how to identify that when you're looking at assembly language. And again, for each of these you know, C constructs, we're going to talk about how you can sort of interpret, view, and modify these with Ghidra. So you know real quick for everybody i think it's already already been mentioned in the chat so this is a bit redundant but office hours are going to be thursday at six o'clock if you have questions please submit them via the zoom chat or the group chat on the hackaday io page so you can submit questions through any one of those and we will answer those questions and then post them up onto the hackaday page after the office hours so with all that out of the way let's get started with talking about how programs actually start up. So you've probably noticed if you looked at the exercises, there's additional code to, you know, just the main function, right? And so all of these code blocks are kind of used to assist with properly launching the binary. And all of this program behavior and all of this sort of startup behavior is defined by kind of the ABI. And so when you look at the ELF header, there's a specific field called the e-entry field. And this points to the underscore start function. And if you take a look at that, when you're looking at your uh, code in Ghidra, that eventually is what calls main. And so the reason I kind of wanted to quickly go over this with you is if any of you are struggling kind of where to find the code of interest when you're looking at the exercises, this is kind of how these programs are constructed and kind of how they start up. So. Since all of our exercises are for x86-64 Linux, they're going to conform to the system V ABI. And so we can take information from that, from that, you know, we talked about that in the last session, the application binary interface. We can take that information and use it to kind of clean up the decompiler output. And we, the arguments to the main function then are actually going to be determined by this ABI. So we can utilize that information as well. So when talking about this stuff, and we talked about this a little bit during the office hour, you have things called function signatures in Ghidra. And so those of you that are familiar with coding or you know, understand what kind of a function signature is, but essentially this tells us you know, the argument count, 
the types for the various arguments and the return values for a specific function. And as we displayed quickly during the office hour, fixing up that function signature can make the output of the decompiler a whole lot more readable. And so we're gonna have a quick example of that uh, after this next slide. And then I saw somebody raise their hand, so we'll take the question really quick. And so part of cleaning up this function signature involves you know, fixing up these arguments that are passed to the function. And so those of you that have written C before are familiar with kind of the two common arguments that you pass to any C program. And again, this is defined by the ABI. So this is kind of the same concept we talked about in the last session of looking for the few things that we know to sort of be true when we're running a program, right? If the ABI defines these certain things, it's relatively safe for us to assume that they're going to be there for our particular target, which is x86-64 Linux. So since we know that the main function is going to get called with two arguments, right, the argument count and the argument vector, we can clean that up in Ghidra to make it a little more readable. And so what that would look like is let's say you have a function, and this was pulled from one of the exercises from last week. So we have our main function here, and you can see that we have you know two arguments, but for some reason, Ghidra believes the second argument is uh, long and the first argument is an int. The first, arg the first one is correct, but the second one is obviously not, right? Because we know that the second one is supposed to be our argument vector. So if we want to fix that up, what we can do in Ghidra is this. You can right-click the function name and click Edit Function Signature. And when you do that, that's gonna bring up this menu here, which will let you edit the function signature. You can change the name, you can change the return value, and what we're gonna do is you can change the arguments. And so if we take those values and change them to match the C standard, right, and the, the regular ABI, let's take a look at how that affects the decompiler output afterwards. So look at this. So before where we had all kinds of, you know, We'll just go back real quick. We had all these crazy accesses going on to get to this variable. And, and yes, if you look at the assembly and you're familiar with this, you may be able to figure out like, oh yeah, this is the first element in the argument vector. But once you clean up the, when you clean up the function signature, it just becomes a lot more readable, right? And so here also these, we have accesses to these two dimensional arrays. And again, if we go back and look at these before cleaning up the function signature, I mean, this is this is certainly readable for those of you that are that are used to it. But you know, when we go through and clean that up, it just becomes you know much more streamlined and much more readable. And this little this little trick will work on all of the exercises that we have for this course. And so, this was just kind of a refresher and a bit of a series of tips for these exercises as everybody works through them. And four new ones were added today, so. Those of you that are following along with those have uh, four new exercises to look forward to. And maybe actually it might be five. So more homework, exactly what you want, I'm sure. So uh, the next thing I want to talk about in relation to making sure everybody knows what to do with these exercises is we're going to review kind of imports and exports. So these things are defined, you know, by the ELF header and essentially these are either functions that you know might be being exported for other programs to use, and they also define functions that are imported that our program needs to use. And so for our challenges, if we wanna find main, we can look at the symbol tree in Ghidra and navigate to that, because again, that's defined by the ABI. And if you can't find that, a good place to start is the underscore start function. And so the imports window in Ghidra looks like this. And so you'll see in the symbol tree of imports, exports, it finds all the functions that are that it can that it finds during auto analysis, any labels that you make, any additional classes that you make in the various namespaces. And of course, you can go in here and rename things and edit things. But for our exercises, if you want to jump to the kind of jump right to the main function and what you'll be interested in, you can open the functions window here scroll down to main, 
and double click on that. And that'll take you to the main function, which for the exercises that we're gonna be doing are gonna be your starting point. And so I just wanted to go over those few quick tips regarding the exercises so that everybody was kind of on the same page for those of you that may not have made to the office hours. So really quick, let me check this. Okay. Yeah. So those of you that, that have questions, please uh, feel free to submit those to the, the Q and a for the office hours. And I noticed somebody asked about answers to the exercises. The, what I would like to do, if you have a question about a specific exercise for now, uh, reach out to me and I can either help you with it or give you the answer. Uh, I don't want to post the answers just yet. I want people to try to work through them. So we'll probably post the answers at a staggered rate. Or if you want to reach out to other people in the chat on the IO page to ask for some help and work through them, that, uh, that's something you can do as well. The, the reason being is I don't want the answer to be there as a kind of a temptation for you to just look at. So I'd like for everybody to try it, you know, to work through those as best they can. And then uh, we'll release the answers kind of in a staggered fashion so that nobody gets caught up for too long or hung up for too long rather. So now that we've gone over the, how to kind of load our exercises into Ghidra as a bit of a, a recap for those of you that weren't in the office hour, we want to talk a little bit about control flow. And so from kind of a 10,000 foot view, control flow is the order in which instructions are executed on your computer. And these kind of commands or constructs in C might look like if statements, go to statements, switch statements, while statements, <clears throat> etc. And so these, as the name describes, right, kind of control the flow of execution. And so if you're trying to figure out what a program does, figuring out the path that it's taking when executing is very important because you may not always have a, a full-fledged debugger at your disposal and you may not be able to even run the code you're looking at, right? So if you're looking at maybe a firmware image and you don't have hardware debugging on your platform, you are going to have to have a pretty solid understanding of this because you won't be able to set breakpoints and see exactly how things are running. And so as we kind of covered in the previous class, right, we know that RIP contains the address of the next instruction to execute and the jump instruction can alter RIP. And we talked about the syntax of that instruction. If uh, you need a refresher to that, please refer to the, the first class slides or the Intel x86 uh, manual that's linked on the page. We briefly talked about how the jump instruction can selectively execute based on the contents of the flags register. And we talked about how the flags register is set after a compare instruction based on the two values, right? So the second argument subtracted from the first, and then based on the arithmetic result, there are various flags are set in the flags register. And you can then determine how you want to move forward with your program based on those flags with these jump instructions. So if the two arguments are equal, you can take a branch. If they're not equal, you can take a branch. Um, you can jump if greater, jump if less. And so these are at the low level, what you're going to see in terms of instead of maybe your if else statement or and things like that. So for example, if we have this block of assembly here, and we take a look at, let's take a look at this instruction. So here we're comparing some variable on the stack to the value 100. Okay, so what this is gonna do, it's gonna subtract 100 from this variable on the stack, store any flags that get set in the flags register. Remember the compare instruction doesn't actually alter the, what the contents of the registers. It's just used to set the flags instruction. And so, if our variable on the stack here was less than 100, we're going to jump to this portion of the program. Otherwise, we're going to continue execution as normal, right? So this is kind of exa an example of how what an if else might look like. And don't worry, we're gonna we're gonna go into this in much more detail. This is just kind of a high level view of what these compare instructions are going to look like when you come across them, and how the jump instruction can be used with these extensions to figure out where uh, where you're going to land.
Okay, I'm just checking the, okay. So to get a better understanding of control flow, Ghidra has something called a graph view. Because when you're looking at something like this, right, you, it might not may be, you know, super clear where this jump is actually going to go or how the overall flow of the program is structured, especially if there are multiple jump instructions, right? So Ghidra has a graph view that you can use that will actually break out all the different conditional statements into their own blocks of code. And this can be extremely useful when you're trying to figure out sort of the overall flow of the program, right? And you can get to this by highlighting a function name and then go to window and then function graph. So what that would look like in Ghidra is this. So we've got the window tab here. We click function graph and we've highlighted the main function. And then this is what it's gonna show. And so you can see where this is, it's probably not the easiest thing to read, right? But it still gives you an idea of this is probably our, you know, our final else block here, right? So looking at, this we can see that there are multiple checks here that if the condition is uh if the call function if the call occurs we go down here if not we jump down here so this kind of function graph is super useful for getting a quick view of the overall structure of the program and so for control flow we've got an exercise in the github repo and a couple of supplemental questions for the exercise in addition to trying to solve, you know, the passcode, which that's going to be the format most of these take is, you know, solving for the passcode. When we get into sessions three and four, you're going to be doing, you're going to be interacting with these programs in a slightly more advanced way. But for session two, your passcodes and your key codes for the exercises are going to be things that you can enter in through. Uh, the keyboard. So they're all going to be in the valid ASCII range. Now that's going to change soon. And we're going to go over how to get around that in later sessions. So in exercise one in control flow one, load it up into Ghidra like we did in the previous one, fix up main like we talked about with the function signature. And the first thing, once you find main, uh, look at how many comparison statements there are. And what are the three values that are being compared? And then lastly, can you pass the check? So there's three different checks that are gonna be performed on the values that you enter into the program. And if you can figure out these comparisons that are being made, you should be able to feed it the two values that should properly pass all the checks. And so we can go over that. If anybody has any questions about that, we can go over it during office hours. We can talk about it on the course page, any of those, any of those work. So, Another form of control flow are switch cases. And, and those of you that have written you know, C code have seen these before. So switch cases essentially allow you know, a single variable to be compared against a list of values. And each of these values is you know, considered a case. And you can have any number of cases. And there are you know, very few rules kind of for the, the switch case. But the expression for the case has to be the same data type as to the variable in the switch. And so each of these cases then terminates on what's called a break statement. And what that would look like in C is something like this. So on the left, we have some C code here that grabs an integer value. Note that we cast it to a character. And then if the integer value is you know, lowercase a, lowercase b, if it's lowercase a, we set the value a to 1, and then we exit. If it's lowercase b, we set it equal to 2, and then we exit. And so this is a very you know, boilerplate example for how switch cases would work. And on the right, we have the assembly representation for this code. So let's talk about how this is actually gonna execute and what's gonna happen. So first we're gonna call um, the A2I function, right? Our return value is gonna be an EAX and we're gonna store that, we're gonna store that onto the stack. And then we're gonna immediately copy it right back in to, uh, EAX. So EAX contains our return value from the A to I function. And so when this first check gets performed in the switch case, those of you, if you're looking at the assembly on the right, you can probably guess where this is going, right? So this is the comparison. Hex 61 is also uh, lowercase a. 
So this is the comparison that's being performed. Now, this is setting the relevant flags in the flags register. And if they are equal, we're going to jump to main plus hex 50, okay, which is also 6DA, as you can see in the assembly listing. And so what's at 6DA? If they're equal, we jump to 6DA. And remember, this is the address, or this is where our result was stored on the stack, right? And so we're storing one to that result on the stack. So this is us setting A equal to one. And then after that, we have the break statement, right? And this jumps to kind of the end of the function where we return. And so this is sort of how this switch construct gets converted from you know C code to assembly code. And again, if we looked at the case for B, if it didn't pass this comparison, right? So if we failed and they weren't equal, it would then just execute the next instruction. And so that would compare our value to hex 62, which is lowercase b. <coughs> excuse, excuse me. And if that comparison passed, we would jump if equal to 6e3, where we would store 2 into that variable. And then the last case, the default case in the switch statement, which is kind of the fall through, stores 3. And we can see that here. So this is kind of what switch statements look like when you go from C to assembly. And, and this can change, you know, based on the value that you're using to compare with. Um, but this is kind of a quick look at how these statements get generated in assembly. And so it's important to be able to see something like this and kind of understand from looking at this, okay, I have, you know, a handful of comparisons and then eventually they all jump out to the same location. So you can kind of look at that and start to reconstruct the switch case from that, right? Because the location that they all eventually jump out to is where you go when you break. Uh, and so you can kind of work backwards from there to reconstruct this, uh, this switch statement. And so when you're looking at something like this and when you're looking at, you know, kind of data in Gitra in general, something that you might want to do is convert the data types. So as we were going back and forth here, we were talking about how, oh, this is also, you know, hex 61 and this is hex 62. And sometimes you might just want to, you know, convert those so that it's more readable, so that it's easier for you to understand, et cetera. There are multiple reasons you would want to change data types. And it might be because the program is casting it a certain way and you want the output to display it in the way that it's being cast so that you can understand it better. And so Ghidra will let you do that by right-clicking an immediate value in the assembly listing and then selecting convert. And this can also propagate out to the decompiler output and make it a little more readable. And really quick, what we're gonna be doing throughout this lesson is kind of going over these C constructs, looking at them from C to assembly, and then talking about a Ghidra tip to make looking at these constructs a little more doable and a little more user-friendly. And then we'll close out with a description of the exercise for each one. So, in Ghidra, let's say this probably looks very familiar because it's the code we were looking at before. And so let's say you want to change this to actually display this character in lowercase a. So you can right-click that immediate value and go down to convert and then select, you know, character sequence. And so once you do that, that will be propagated throughout the decompiler output. So it'll actually have the characters instead of the decimal value. And you can do that, you know, in either direction. If you wanted to look at them in decimal, do it in decimal. If you want to look at them as the character representation, you can look at them as the character representation. This is mainly useful to make things more readable and to make, you know, the code make a little more sense to you when you're looking at it. So that is kind of the quick Ghidra tip for how to convert various data types. And so we don't have an exercise for switch cases because as you're going to find a lot of these looping structures and these kind of comparison structures break down to look very similar in assembly language. So the next thing that we're going to talk about are loops. And so loops are kind of day one programming, right? Everyone has probably written, you know, a for loop or a while loop, et cetera. But uh, for those of you that, that maybe haven't, loops allow for, you know, repeated execution of a certain block of code. And again, it's a very common programming structure and the statements in the loop are typically exec executed, you know, sequentially. 
And you can see that represented in assembly language in a lot of ways. There, there's actually some x86 instructions that are built to you know, loop. And you can look those up in the manual, uh, loop and rep are two of those. And loops, you know, typically operate under like a conditional code. So it'll be, you know, for X less than this or while, you know, some variable is not equal to some, some value. There are some exceptions when you're looking at, you know, embedded systems. Those of you that have written code for embedded systems, most of the time the main function is surrounded by just a while true loop so that it is always executing. And that's sometimes done as a last ditch effort to make things, you know, fail safe and to make sure the code is always running. Um, so you may sometimes see like a while true when you're looking at a firmware blob or, you know, an embedded system. So let's talk about loops. Let's go kind of from C to assembly. So we have a very, very similar structure to what we were looking at before. We have the C code on the left and the assembly code on the right. So the first thing that happens is we call, you know, our function to grab the integer representation of the first argument that's passed to the program. And we're storing that on the stack at uh, base pointer minus hex four. Okay. The next thing we're going to do, if we follow this code sequentially, is we have another local variable called sum, and we're storing that at minus hex C, and we're storing zero into that, just like we see on the, in the C representation on the left side. And then we have a variable X and just really quick, right? You'll notice X is used. We declare it here and we also declare it again down here. So with no optimizations turned on, you'll see that we have, you know, zero getting moved into our X variable, which is at RBP minus eight. And then we have it again when we talk about the loop. And so you're probably wondering if you're looking at this assembly, right? What this loop is doing is we are adding up uh, for every value or for, you know, zero to whatever value we add, we increment sum by our X value here as the loop continues. So very simple, very straightforward loop. And so the next instruction, right, you notice we jump to 6D5. And so why are we doing that? We're doing that because at 6D5, you see we have this compare instruction, right, that is comparing our, it moves our x variable into eax, right? And then it compares it against our count variable, right? So here's our count variable, which again, we stored at rbp minus four. And x, as we talked about before, is at rbp minus eight. So at this point, x is an eax, count is at rbp minus four, and we are comparing those two, just like we're doing here in the for loop. And so if it's less than, which means we're going to continue the loop, we jump back, we jump to the start of the loop here. And so the first thing we do here is, again, we grab our X value, we store it into EAX, and then we add our X value, which is now an EAX, to RBP minus hex C, right? And that is our sum variable here, right? We talked about that before. Sum was stored here on the stack. And then we, the last statement kind of in the loop structure here is we add one to, again, our X variable at RBP minus hex eight. And then we go, we continue to go down and do this comparison. So again, we check, we load X into EAX, then we compare it against our count variable. And if it's still less, we continue the loop. And so this is kind of a fairly, you know, simple example of how a for loop goes from something that you write in C to an assembly structure. And if you would look at this in graph view, there would be an arrow that would loop around and point to that same block of code as the loop would continue. And so another type of loop that, you know, you'll see, and it's going to look very similar from the assembly perspective is, you know, the while loop. And you'll notice here that the differences between these two are, there's not many. Right. So you'll notice that there's not the additional um, assignment of X to zero because we're not doing that here. But again, the first thing it does is it jumps down and checks to make sure that X is less than count before continuing. And then we do kind of the same exact loop that we had before. So 
determining whether it's a while loop or a for loop may be important to you later on when you're looking at you know more advanced things but i just wanted to illustrate here that you know while these look differently and may behave slightly differently in you know c they the assembly representation is fairly similar and so when you're looking at you know big blocks of assembly where you're keeping track of you know we're keeping track of lots of little local variables here and it's kind of hard to without you know renaming them or labeling them to figure out where you are and so this is where kind of highlighting and slicing come into play comes into play and this is really nice for if you had a big loop and a variable was getting reused a lot you can use this to highlight a variable and see where it's used throughout the entire function and so you can apply this in the decompiler window and it will attempt to you know kind of synchronize the highlights between the disassembly and the decompiler view and you know sometimes that works better than others but an example of what that might look like is this so you know here again this is kind of one of the this is an example this is one of the bonus exercises that we released last week that was pulled from one. and so we have um, this function and if you middle click a specific variable so if we want to highlight string length and follow it all the way through we can just highlight it here and it will show us all the uses of it and you know this is nice when you're looking at larger functions or you're trying to keep track of multiple variables things like that and you can also highlight you know all uses of that variable moving forward so if you want to only see how a certain variable is used moving forward you can right click and do like highlight forward instruction slice or if you want to see you know backwards you can do highlight backwards instruction slice and so here's an example of that as well you'll notice it didn't highlight the param1 value back here so this is us keeping track of all the param1 instances here which is the first argument to our check serial function and so for you know loops and iterations we've got an exercise for you and this is going to be in session two exercises loop example one and in addition to sort of solving for the the passcode as you're fairly used to do by now uh, a couple of additional questions for you to sort of solidify your understanding of loops is you know how many times does this loop run is it looking for anything in particular while it's looping through things and then can you generate you know the right the right passcode here and so we'll, we can go over all these during the office hours if people want and we can also you know talk about them in chat on the class page as well and so you know we're talking about loops we're talking about variables that's something we haven't really covered yet and i wanted to talk about you know variable representation in assembly language and kind of how that translates from c to assembly so those of you that have you know written code before you know that when a variable is declared it, it's declared within a particular scope which means that certain things have access to it and certain things don't and so for our purposes we're going to kind of talk about two the two big uh kind of blocks that variables can fall under so local and global so local variables are defined within a function they're typically only accessible within the function unless they are passed out you know by reference um or by value rather and even then it's just the value not necessarily the actual variable so you know global variables are declared outside of a function they can be used across you know your entire program and these are both represented differently in assembly language and so we have an example here to sort of walk through you know what that looks like so you know here we've got again a fairly simple example of some c code we have a global variable of hex 15 we have two local variables we do some arithmetic on the local and global variables and then we exit and again the purpose of this is just to show you kind of what these constructs are actually going to look like when you start looking at assembly and trying to work your way backwards so the you know first things first here we've got our function prolog where we're kind of setting up the function we're storing both um, the argument count and the argument vector onto the stack and the next thing we're going to do is declare our local variables and so we talked about the stack before and how the base pointer you know points to the bottom of the stack or the, the base of the stack right so at offset base pointer minus eight we're storing our local variable local var and we're storing hex 10 there and at minus four we're storing hex 11 which is local var two 
So these two locations on the stack are going to be the placeholders for these variables, these local variables that we talk about. Now, we've also got this global variable, which doesn't reside on the stack, as we can see. So if we look at the next uh, statement with the global variable, we see that we're grabbing something at an offset from RIP. And that's because this global variable is stored in the data section of this ELF file. So we talked about how the ELF file has like various sections and things like that. One of those is used for you know storing global variables. So the disassembler was able to, to read the ELF file and see a symbol for the global var and know that it's going to be at RIP plus this value. And it's going to point to our global variable. So here we are moving our global variable, global var, into EDX. We're moving our local var, right, which is at RBP minus hex 8 into EAX, right? And then we're adding the two, which is what we can see, what we can see down here, right? And so next we then take the value in EAX, and we're storing that back into the location where the global variable lives. And so our next statement, and again, as we talked about before, this is actually stored in the .data section of the ELF file. And so you have this kind of mix of interacting with things on the stack and interacting with things in the data section. And remember, the ELF file maps out where these things are going to be loaded into RAM. And so that's how the OS knows, okay, even though it's not on the stack, I do know, you know, relative to me where it's going to be loaded into RAM. And then, so now, right, we have, remember our, um, <clears throat> excuse me, local var2, right, which was at RBP minus four. We are grabbing the, lo the global variable again from this offset, storing it into EAX. And then we're adding it to, remember, what was it RBP minus four, our local variable two, right? And so we are adding that to it and storing it back into that location. And I know this is a lot to kind of keep track of with, you know, PowerPoint. And I hope that this is able to illustrate these concepts in some way. And if anybody has any questions about this, we can definitely go over this more, you know, during the office hours or on the course page. And so the last thing that we do right, is we're moving the value zero into the location of our global variable. And then we're setting our return code and exiting. And so I know that was a lot, but the two big takeaways are that local variables are going to be on the stack and then global variables are either going to be, you know, on the heap or on the, in the data section. And so when you're looking at all these variables, right, instead of, you know, remembering these offsets and things like that, it's you know, much easier to kind of label and rename these things to something that's a little more human readable. And Ghidra can do that for you. So we'll talk about how you can do that. So let's say you have a function like this. And this is, you know, it's kind of tough to read, right? We haven't fixed up the, uh, we haven't fixed, fixed up the function parameters yet. We haven't renamed any of these variables. This all is you know, fairly difficult to read. But if we wanted to say rename something like this, if we look at this, we can see that this variable is probably being used as a counter, right? Because if we look at the bottom of this loop, we see it being incremented by one, it's checked against eight. And so instead of, you know, I stack 20, if we wanted to name that to something more human readable, you can right click it and click rename variable. And then a window will pop up asking you what you want to rename it as. You click, we will call it count because that's what it's being used for. And then bam, that gets propagated kind of throughout the rest of the, the program. And it just makes it a little more easy to understand. It's easier to keep track of, you know, you don't, cause the default names will just be, you know, uvar1, uvar2, uvar3, et cetera. And so having these named makes it a little easier for you to sort of keep track of them as you go through some of these exercises. And so for variables, we have an exercise in exercises, variables example. And as you go through this and figure out what the password is, think about and try to determine, you know, how many global variables are being used, how many local variables are being used, and can you solve for, you know, the proper key code. And so, you know, we have, we've talked about 
control flow. We've talked about variables. We've talked about things like that. And you can't really get into control flow without talking about function calls. And so functions in C are implemented using you know, the call instruction assembly. And what that does is it pushes the return address to the stack and then jumps to the address that it's, it is used as an argument. And when you issue the call instruction, the first six parameters are passed in through registers. So when you are analyzing a function and you see it pull something from RDI, RSI, RDX, those are the arguments that it's loading. And so these are all again defined by the ABI that we talked about before. And so call is used to jump to a function and then ret is used to return from it. And what the ret instruction does is it actually pops the address off the stack and it assumes that you're now pointing to the address that call push there and then you jump back and you store that into RIP. And so that's kind of a tough thing to you know, strictly relay verbally. So let's talk about what a function call would look like from someone calling the function. So what do you need to do if you're gonna call a function in assembly language and what does that look like? So we've got our stack here on the right. Now remember the stack grows from high to low and we have our main function here. So the first thing that we're gonna do, we push RBP onto the stack and now we point RBP and RSP to the same thing. So we've moved the RSP value into RBP and so this is now, you know, mains stack frame, right? The next thing that we do is we subtract 10 from RSP, which now means that RSP points to, we'll call it, you know, the bottom of the stack here. And the next thing that we do is we're loading some variables onto the stack. So what are we doing? We're moving EDI onto the stack, right? Because we're doing RBP minus four which is going to be here because remember this grows from high to low. And then next we move RSI onto the stack. And then we are moving hex F into EDI. And then we're calling a function. Okay. So what we're doing here when we call this function is we push the next address onto the stack and then jump to this code. Okay. And so when we jump to this, function, it's going to return by issuing, you know, a ret instruction and it's going to use the EDI value, which is passed through the register as an argument. So arguments are passed through registers. And in order to do that, what the main function had to do here was store its EDI value onto the stack before it jumped. So it knew, okay, I'm going to, I have to feed you know, hex F to this function. This is what I'm going to call it with. I need to save my EDI value before I call it. And so this falls on, you know, the responsibility of the code calling the function. They need to store their state before they call the function. They have to store the state and set up the registers appropriately. And so, you know, where is all of this defined? This again is kind of, it's defined in the, the calling conventions that are defined in the, you know, system V ABI. And it's going to define, you know, how you pass arguments, how you return values, and how the stack is managed and how registers need to be cleaned up. And this calling convention defines, you know, like the epilogue and the prologue for functions. So it defines, you know, what you need to do when you enter a function and what you need to do before you leave. And so you can refer to that document for, you know, a much more detailed description of what to do and what those things will look like. And we can post links to that on the course page as well. But really the core thing is that the prologue reserves the space for variables on the stack and then the epilogue cleans it up and returns it to its original state. And so again, what that might look like going from C to assembly is we have our function here. We are where we have, you know, two local variables, some variable, and we're just going to add the value that we pass to this function to sum, and we're going to add the local variable to sum. Okay, so we're actually not even using uh, local var2. It's just here to kind of demonstrate a point, uh, you know, as to like where local variables get put on the stack. So again, we have the initial function set up where we set up our stack pointer. We push RBP onto the stack, and then like we did in the previous one, we set our stack pointer equal to uh, RBP. So now we have like a fresh new, you know, untouched region of memory to work with. And so the first thing we're doing is we are 
taking the EDI value, right, which is the argument that's passed to the function that's stored in EDI. So this, in our case, is going to be our X value, right? And that's going to go on the stack at RBP minus hex 14. Next, we are going to load 10 into our first local variable, local bar, right? And then following that, as you would imagine, we're going to load 14 into RBP minus 8. And then sum, which is going to be at RBP minus 4, we're loading 0 into. And so here, right, remember what was at RBP minus 14, the EDI value that we were passed to, or was passed to us when the function got called. So again, EDI contains the argument to our function. And we're moving that into EAX. And then we're adding it to sum, right? Remember we talked about sum is stored at RBP minus four, and we're adding our EAX value or the EAX value here, which now contains the argument to this function. And so next we're grabbing that local variable here and storing it into EAX, right? And then we are adding to that sum variable, which again at RBP minus four, we're adding this value to it and storing it back into sum. And then before we exit, we restore the base pointer and then we ret. So we grab the next address off. We grab the address that was pushed to the stack when we issued the call statement and we jump to that and resume execution. And so when you're working with functions in Ghidra, it can be difficult to, if you want to maybe compare two functions or you want to get you know, maybe a new version of a program came out that you're looking at and you want to compare those two, you can do that because Ghidra has a function comparison window. And this is super useful when doing, you know, side-by-side -side comparisons of functions. And you can do it such that it will compare both the listing, the assembly listing, and the decompiler view. And so to do that, you highlight two functions and you right-click compare selected functions. So let's talk about what that would look like in the Ghidra listing. So we've got... Um, you know, two functions here. And obviously these functions are very different. This is just to demonstrate the capability. So we highlight, you know, start in this deregister TM clones and click compare functions. And so here, you know, we can obviously see these functions are very different and, you know, these differences are, are highlighted here too. So the, I just wanted to show this as something that you might find useful if you're ever comparing two functions. Uh, it's a pretty useful component that Ghidra has to offer. And so for functions, we have an example in the exercises. And in addition, again, to kind of solving for the password and trying to crack the password, can you also figure out how many functions does the regular auto analysis discover? And within those functions, how many local variables are present and what are their values? So this kind of builds off of the other things that we've learned and talked about through this lesson. And do any of these functions take any arguments? If so, you know, what are they? And so, you know, we've talked about local variables, we've talked about stack memory, and the next thing we kind of have on our list to talk about is, is heap memory, which is used for, you know, those of you that have used, you know, malloc and calloc before are aware that it's used for dynamic memory allocations. And so heap memory, typically in our environment that we're working in, isn't managed automatically, so developers have to manage it. You have to free it when you're done with it, and failure to do so can result in memory leaks and failure to properly, you know, manage your code that you allocate on the heap can also heap can also lead to other kinds of vulnerabilities as well. But heap variables can be accessed, you know, globally really by passing the pointer to the thing that was allocated on the heap. And so just to kind of talk about, you know, stack versus heap, the stack is kind of managed for us for the most part. There's not really a need to, you know, deallocate unless you're hand rolling assembly. Uh, it's limited, you know, by stack size, which is OS dependent. You've got sort of statically sized variables, whereas the heap, you know, there's within reason and within the amount of memory that you have or the virtual address space that you have, there's not really a huge limit on size and it has to be managed by the user. And to kind of illustrate what this looks like as opposed to what we've looked at before, we have an exercise in the exercises folder called, you know, heap example one. And this one is, it's not a very complex exercise. It's just to show you kind of what the calls to malloc look like from you know an assembly representation. And so when you're looking at this, it's gonna be very similar to the loop example. 
So, you know, a couple additional questions as you go through and solve this are, you know, how is, how much memory are we allocating and how is this different than the loop example? And so that was kind of a quick overview on heat memory. We'll get into it more in later sessions. I just wanted to touch on it so that everyone is aware of what it is. And we have a very simple exercise for that, that as I said before, it's very similar to the loop example. It shouldn't really give you too much trouble once you solve for the loop example. And so kind of the last C construct we're going to talk about tonight are, you know, array accesses. And when you ask, when you see accesses of an array, we're going to see an instruction that we haven't talked about yet. And that's the load effective address instruction. And so remember in the previous one, we talked about how when there are, you know, brackets around an argument, the, the calculation is performed on those, those uh, arguments. And then the memory is fetched at that address. And that is the case for the move instruction. But for the load effective address instruction, we actually just calculate this value and store it into EAX. So we're loading this calculated address with this calculated value into EAX without actually dereferencing memory. And so what this looks like from a C to assembly representation is as follows. So here again, we've got our standard function prologue. We're setting everything up. We're grabbing the arg C, the arg V. We've got X, which we're setting to zero here. Then of course we have this jump where we go down and check if X is less than 10, right? So see, we're comparing X, which is at RBP minus four to nine. If it's less than, we jump back and go through to here. And then, so next we jump through and we grab X and store it into EAX. And this, the next instruction, like sign extends X, C, D, Q, E. And so here we're loading the effective address of, you know, what X is into REX. So we're taking, you know, our, <clears throat> our X value times four, and we're using that and we're taking that and loading it into RCX. Now here, right, you'll notice that we have another global variable, which is our nums variable. And we're grabbing our X value, right? Remember at RBP minus four, storing that into EDX. And then finally, we are storing that value at RAX, which is the address of our variable, plus the RCX offset, which is calculated here. And then we're storing EDX into that. And so this is how we are indexing into that array. So the reason X is being multiplied by four is because it is a, uh, it's an index into an array of integers. So that are gonna be, you know, in this case, uh, these ones are four bytes. And so here we increment X, compare it to nine. And if it's, once we get to the point where this comparison fails, we exit the function. And so this is kind of how the LEA instruction is used to calculate offsets in um, arrays. And so with Ghidra, you can create arrays. And if Ghidra doesn't automatically detect them, if the types are not properly set in the decompiler, you can go through and create an array. And so let's say we have this function call here where we're printing something and you can see that we're dereferencing de something with an offset that is used in the loop times four. So there's a good chance that this is an array, right? So if we double click on this to jump to that location, we see here, okay, we have a list of, of you know, values here. And we can see that it's xref, it's red from where we were previously in the function. Now to create an array, first we have to identify, you know, the data type of what we think the array is. And so here it looks like, you know, it's an unsigned integer. And so if we go here and we right click and click data and create, we create an unsigned integer. So we go to data and then uint. And once we've done that once, we can go through and create an array. And so if we look back at this code, right, it's counting 10 times. So we can probably assume there's 10 elements in this array. And so we go through, we create the unsigned integer, and now we're going to tell it, hey, there's actually an array of 10 unsigned integers here. And so you just click create array, tell it how many elements are going to be there. And it will try to give you an estimate of what it thinks should be there without overriding any existing data, which is a nice feature. And then once you click okay, 
you'll see here we have our array of integers. And this just makes the code, you know, much more readable, right? So we have our, our array of unsigned integers here with the index, and that's slightly more readable than what we had before because we were able to use Ghidra to define, you know, this array structure. And so for this exercise, we have an example as well. It's called, you know, array example. And when you're going through this and trying to figure out what the uh, passcode is for the various indexes you can pass into the program, what are the scope of these arrays? Are they global? How many of these are in use? Can you reconstruct them in Ghidra using the various things that we've learned today? And so finally, to wrap up right on time, today we've reviewed how to identify various C constructs in C. And I know a lot of people have talked to me about, you know, it's, it feels really great to use the decompiler and they're, they're leaning heavily on the decompiler to solve the exercises. And that's, that's great. And it's important to understand though, that the decompiler isn't always a hundred percent perfect. So sometimes you have to, you know, look at the assembly side and infer things from that to sort of fix up the decompiler. And by doing that, you can kind of cover more options than if you're just solely looking at the decompiler. Again, the decompiler is excellent, but sometimes knowing how to sort of manipulate the data types in Ghidra allows you to kind of streamline the reversing process a little more and make things a little, I won't say easier, but easier to read and kind of easier to understand. And so that's why for each of these kind of constructs, we went over a way to make Ghidra understand those constructs a little better and to make them easier for you to read. And so the exercises, all these exercises are available on the GitHub page. And with that, are there any, you know, quick questions? I'm going to stop screen share real quick and look at the chat log because I have not yet had a chance to look. Um, okay, so Brian says you found the binaries, but there isn't a description of what you're trying to find. The, so if you run them without arguments, it'll tell you what it's looking for. And uh, if you need more help, please uh, reach out in chat. The, the chat is public on the github.io page, and I check it fairly regularly. So, and so are there questions for the exercises? No, so the format of these exercises, folks, are kind of like a typical, they're called, you know, crack me. So they are you're typically trying to provide, you know, a password and the program is going to tell you that you either provided the right password or the wrong password. And that's going to be the structure of the, these exercises. And for the next session, we're going to change that up a little bit. And we're going to go over kind of how to do that in session three. So Andrew says, Mark arrays again. Yeah, sure. So when you make arrays, uh, you have to create the data type first at the address. So that's why we go here and we right click and click data uh, uint because it's an unsigned integer. And then once you have that, you go through and actually create the array. Um, and there might be a way to create the array just without creating the data type first. This is just how I've always done it. So you click create array, tell it how many elements are there, and then it'll generate the array for you. And yes, you will have to run chmod on the binaries to execute them. I'll add that to, to, the, to the readme for those. That's a really good point. I think it was Chris that said that. So thank you for that, Chris. Make sure I actually got that name right. I apologize if I didn't. Um, but yeah, so that's, uh, that's it for today, everybody. Thanks for, thanks for joining us again. And, and please, you know, ask, ask away on the Hackaday IO page. I know some of you are really tearing through these exercises and it would be cool to start, you know, seeing people maybe work together on some of these and things like that. So, uh, and, you know, reach out to me on, on Twitter or where else if you have any other questions or need anything else. So thanks for coming. Again, appreciate everybody taking the time. Uh, and those of you that want to come to the office hour, just reach out to, to uh, you can reach out to me or the super conference email that was posted and we can get you guys a link to the office hour.